thank you very much for joining us this evening. And it gives me a chance to share some ideas, share some thoughts from my most recent publication titled Throwing Sheep in the Boat Room. People often ask me, what does the title mean? And it's a good point probably to start the presentation. How many of you are members of Facebook? Can you just raise your hand? Pretty, pretty, pretty much everyone. Okay, so, so it's a very strong uh, following and penetration as you can see at least in this audience. Now on Facebook, there is a small little application which is throwing sheep. So you can throw a sheep at someone and that's a playful gesture to get someone's attention. Now you can also do other interesting things like send a vampire bite or lick someone or other kinds of more exciting things. But we chose a more playful, fun image of this world represented by Facebook to throw a sheep. And then the classical vertical organization is represented in our title by the boat room. So the title brings these two worlds together. The world represented by these emerging, growing, fluid, dynamic, social, horizontal networks. And the more classical vertical worlds represented by the image of the boat room. And it's our own playful gesture at organizations to tell them, hey, look, something is happening out here. You better take notice, and hopefully you can use it for your own strategic advantages. Now, the number of different trends driving this phenomenon, I will pick on two. The first one is the generational shift that is happening. A lot of us in this room are probably in the age group below 30, and some of us are in the age group above 30. If you are in the first group, especially if you're in the younger side of the first group, it's very important to realize one fact. If you take a young adult today, typically in the range of 15 to 25, let's say in that range. This person does not know what life looks like without the internet. Now at some level you can say, so what? Okay, so you grew up with telephone, you grew up with other technologies, and the internet is yet another technology. But it is much more than that. Why? Because the internet represents a certain way of living, a certain way of behaving and it is creating a set of expectations and what can even be termed as a new set of emerging values. What are these expectations or emerging values? They revolve around themes that we instinctively relate to when we go online. So you have the internet which is a global infrastructure. So when you go out there, you're not alone, you're not local, you are fundamentally in a world with others from around the world. It is very open, very low barriers to access. Even relatively uneducated people today with a mobile phone can access the internet. And as some of you probably know, today the mobile penetration in the world is touching 4 billion people. In five years time, it is expected that about 5 billion people worldwide will be connected to the mobile phone. As the primary access to this internet moves the mobile, you will see that the bulk, the vast majority of the global population will be able to participate. And participation is another key value or expectation. People expect to contribute. And in the same way, people expect to be heard. Interactivity is very important out here. Transparency. People like to know what's happening. People like to rate. People like to evaluate. People like to give opinions. Now, I can go on on these aspects, but you're getting a sense of what I'm talking about out here. These new values of globality, of 
openness, of transparency, of interactivity, of instantaneous interaction, these are affecting and changing the world around us. Why? Because this generation is entering our organizations as employees and are also influencing us as customers or more generally as stakeholders demanding certain behaviors from organizations. And this is something which we cannot ignore because as I said earlier, this set of values or new expectations is coming across, across the world. It is a global phenomenon. Now, I was at uh, the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos in January, and I was moderating a panel titled Technologies for Creative Leadership. Now, one of the panel members was a key figure of Silicon Valley. Someone who has been there for 40 years, one of the key names of Silicon Valley. And he was relating a personal story from his own family. He said that he had four children and his second daughter recently turned 21. So the eldest child, who was a girl, decided to throw a party on Facebook for the younger sister. Now, as many of you know, throwing a party on Facebook basically means you know, making a page, putting content, inviting people to come and join. And the parents were invited. And the parents came and they saw stuff they did not know had happened. They didn't say anything, they let the birthday come and go. After the birthday, the father took the daughter for a walk on the beach and told her, dear daughter, you know, we love you, we are your parents, and we have seen you grow. And we are a little bit concerned by what we saw on your Facebook page. And at the same time, we are your parents, so we understand. You know, we, we try to understand, but what about all the other people from around the world who are also seeing the same stuff? Aren't you concerned that perhaps this can come back to hurt you? And this girl looked at the father and said, Dad, you don't get it. So the father said, okay, you've been telling me that since the day you were born, but now tell me, you know, what do I not get this time? And the girl looked at the father and said, Dad, I will never work for someone like you. <laughs> and that hit the father very much. And he used that line to articulate what he thought was a shift in leadership, shift in values that a lot of us had to relate to, or at least be aware of. So there is a generational shift which is happening, and that is undeniable. It's a global phenomenon. The second, the second shift and the second driver is something very fundamental. It's the velocity of change. Now, this is just some data I took from a recent article in one of the popular magazines in which they took the penetration time for some key technologies to reach 150 million users, adopters, on a worldwide basis. Now, even if you can't read it, don't worry, the lines tell you the story. So, it took fixed telephones, fixed line telephones, almost 90 years to reach a penetration of 150 million users. It took television almost 40 years to reach similar penetration. It took the cell phone 15 years to reach the same penetration. And today, most recently, it took Facebook, as one example, only five years. Now, what does this tell you? It tells you that the time that organizations have, the time that we have as a society, to adopt to these new technologies is shrinking. It's becoming faster and faster. And this is creating pressures, creating pressures on us to be able to respond adequately, to be able to handle the pace of change. And this is non-trivial, because what you had 90 years to adopt to and to adapt to, now you have five years. Tomorrow you have three years. The amount of time 
that you have for adjusting to these technologies is shifting dramatically. How do you as an organization, how do we as a society react to that? And what is interesting is this is not some kind of a phenomena localized in the US or in some developed <coughs> economy. This is a global phenomenon. Now this is some data from Nielsen from March of this year. And I'm sorry I don't have the data from this part of the world, but it gives you a comparable sense of what is happening. Now, if you look at community sites, and you look at the membership of community sites, on a global basis, today almost 70% of the global online population, so 70% of us who are online on the internet, are members of some community site. This is phenomenal. And if you go to some countries like Brazil, the number shoots up to higher than 85%. Now, if you look at the trend across the world, these numbers are moving very rapidly. Today, Facebook alone is adding about a million new members every single day. So this is not a joke. This is global. This is fast moving, and this is almost unavoidable today in the world around us. So with those words, let me sort of tell you in terms of what we found. So when we were doing our research in this area, and this I'm talking about two, two and a half years ago, we went into companies to find out you know, what is happening. And we were very surprised. Very surprised because we found that, in fact, companies were not welcoming this technology, this phenomenon. In fact, many companies were outright banning it. And there were good reasons given for that. Waste of time, productivity loss, security issues, and so on and so forth. And there were good cases, or good examples, in which in the UK, several bureaucrats had lost their job, or had been penalized for using these technologies in the workplace. And that surprised us. Surprised us because when we started researching this two and a half years ago, we did not expect this. This kind of a hostile reaction, both in the private sector and the public sector in many developed economies that looked at then from the financial part of our research. And as we sort of got into the research further, we realized that a lot of this hostility was linked to a fundamental clash, if I can use that word quotation, clash between two sets of values. A value associated with the more classical vertical organizations and a more emergent set of values associated with these more horizontal, fluid social networks. And really what we came to was the insight that it was not about technology. It was about a mindset. It was about a shift in values. So a lot of what I'll talk about right now is not about IT per se. Of course, technology is a key enabler of the change, but it is really about shifting values, shifting expectations, and an adjustment that many of us in private corporations and public corporations and government have to make to these emergent new set of values. So let me explain that a little bit with a framework. So you know, the first instinct of a professor is once you come to that key insight, is how to structure that insight. And we decided to structure it based on these three very key, very fundamental values in terms of how human beings, how we behave and interact with others. Identity is the way we represent ourselves to the world around us. The way we dress, the way we talk, the way we interact. This is all part of our identity. The whole notion of status, how we seek recognition from people around us. When we interact in society, we want recognition, we want social capital. 
that is status. Power is, of course, the ultimate in terms of you want to be able to influence others. You want to be able to get others to do the things that you would like them to do. So we took these three different elements that apply to human beings in all contexts, be it in the private sector, be it in schools, be it in society or in government, and we asked the question, how are these three elements changing? And there you have, in the sub-bullet points, the changes that we identified. So very briefly, we found that identities are getting disaggregated. Status is becoming more democratic, and power is getting more diffused. So let me elaborate more on these three things in some more depth. So let's look at identities. Now, this is a topic that has been studied in the social sciences for many years. Lots of papers, lots of research theses on this topic. And we went and researched many of these papers, and there's some very good theories about how people form identities. And the key, the key element really is a lot of people, most of us in fact, form our identities socially. They're socially constructed, by which we mean that we are members of some social organizations, be it our school, our work environment, our religious organization, some other social, you know, private sports club, whatever. And our identities are defined by our membership in these social organizations. Now, there's one key element of that process. And that process is defined by similarity. That word similarity is very important. Is that we try to be similar to others in that organization in which we're a member of. Think about the schools, the companies, other organizations where you interact. You try to be more like others in the organizations. Why? Partly because maybe there are some commonalities driven by a choice, member of that religious organization, sports club, or organization at work. And sometimes, very often, the organization explicitly or implicitly puts rules and expectations on you in terms of how you dress, how you behave, what you do, how you work. The organizations traditionally do not like very high variants. They do not like people who behave very differently. They want people who are similar. And there are good reasons why you want that. Now today what is happening is there are a whole bunch of these social networks emerging which are fluid, which are dynamic, which are new. There are no well-defined norms and they often cross countries. They span the globe. Now, in this kind of an environment, you suddenly have a lot of freedom. Why? Because there's not one social network, there's not one Facebook. There are hundreds, hundreds, I don't know how many, hundreds of these social networks all over the place, all over the world. So what you have is suddenly you have freedom to express your individuality. And people are doing that. People are using these social networks to express the individuality. And this is creating the room for multiple profiles to be created. Multiple profiles online. A very simple example, which is a very common one, is on Facebook. It's a common example, but all of us know it. When we are on Facebook, the very essence of that is you are sharing some information about your private life with your friends. Okay. Of course, what you're doing is you're showing more of yourself to some people whom you consider your quote-unquote quotation friends. But an interesting question in this context is, how do you react when you get a request to be a friend from superior, subordinate, peer 
in the workplace. You know, I was talking to the top executive of one of the large global defense companies. And she was relating a humorous anecdote in her company. She said one of her top management board members decided to join Facebook. So he went home one day in the evening and joined Facebook. And then he pressed a few wrong buttons. And what Facebook did was he, it uploaded his entire address book and sent a friend request to each one of them. And of course, for the next few days, he was the butt of jokes in the company because people kept asking him, got enough friends, you still need more friends, you know, he became the butt of jokes. And this is you know, a large defense company, an American large defense company. So you know the culture in these organizations. This person was humiliated inside the company. Now, more seriously, she asked the question, what do you do? If you get a friend's request from your boss or your subordinate, do you accept or you don't accept? It's a very important question because what is happening out here is this person in the work context is now giving you, <coughs> willingly, this is very important, willingly access to another part of this person's profile. In this case, the private life. Now, what do you do? Do you accept? If you accept, do you actively participate? Do you actively look? And what if you don't like what you see? Does it influence your opinion about the person? Does it influence your judgment about this person's promotion, rewards, incentives, other kinds of professional decisions? Now these are very interesting questions because what is happening is there's a blurring happening. You had a certain profile as a corporate man or corporate woman. And now suddenly, if you start letting another profile, which is a personal profile, enter and blur the space, you have an interesting question in terms of how should you react to it? Do you accept it willingly? Should you, in fact, make Chinese walls? Should you ignore it? And these are real issues, especially because a lot of young people are putting willingly information about themselves online. Now, a lot of companies actively search for that information. Now, in our book, we have documented many cases of people who have suffered either denied jobs, denied promotions, because of the content of their online profiles. This is the story of the New York Times, in which a bright student was denied a position in one of the major companies because the company found some statements on his online profile that they found unacceptable. The examples of other people in the British Army who denied promotion even though they had very creditable and good track records because of their online profiles. Now how do you handle this? If you're an organization, you're looking to hire the young people. Typically, the CV that a young student sends to a company represents the profile you want to present, the identity you want to present. Now, should the company actively look for other aspects of your identity, which, by the way, you're willingly putting online? Should the company look for what others are saying about you, not just what you are saying about yourself, but what others are saying about you? Because the transparency in the world is extremely high. Now, these are very complex questions. But these are interesting questions which people are struggling with. As you have more of these online identities, profiles being created, how do you aggregate them? Because at one level, some identities are your real personality. 
often, most Facebook pages are aspects of your real life. It's not made up, it's real life. At the other extreme, you have some profiles which are completely false, in some cases deceptive. There are cases in which young teenagers have committed suicide because they have been deceived by false identities. The cases in which people have been taken to prison because they deceived people in a certain way using the online profiles. There's a whole range of questions emerging in terms of as you're seeing more of people around you, how do you handle it? How do you manage it? How do you in fact integrate it into your decision making processes? I just gave you a flavor of some of the questions. There are many others which keep coming up. This is a very typical one in terms of blogging. How many of you blog? I'm just curious. Fair number of you blog. That's good. Now, a very key question that I get asked is, should I allow my CEO to blog? Or should I allow my employees to blog? Now think about what blogging is. Blogging is informal dialogue. You know, you speak your mind, you shoot the breeze, you speak about you know, good things, bad things, your fears, your hopes, your weaknesses. Now, would you want your CEO to talk openly about his or her mind? How would the stock market react? How would the competition react? How would people perceive the CEO? Because the CEO today, in most organizations, is positioned as a strong man or the strong woman. The leader knows all, the leader knows right, the leader makes no mistakes. That is a, a, a sort of a simplification, but not a dramatic simplification of our leadership model today. Now in blogging, do you allow the leader to express his or her doubts? To engage. And an even important question is, should the leader and can the leader even accept critical feedback? Because when you blog, people react. And people often say negative things, critical things, often in harsh language. As a leader, you're often not used to hearing that harsh language. Most leaders live in closed echo chambers in which they just keep hearing back what they like to hear. So it poses a lot of interesting questions about leadership styles. This, by the way, is one of the few Fortune 500 CEOs who blog, Jonathan Schwartz from Sun Microsystems. Now, the second element in terms of status. If you look at the world around us, you know, the world is very much driven by titles. You know, a very simple test is, I often ask managers, executives, how do you see your career developing? I would say in 95% of the cases, the response I get looks something like this. Well, they'll say, I have been in this position for the last two years, and I hope in another two years to move to that position, another four years to other position, another eight years to the corner office out there. Your visualization of your professional development often is in pilots. And this is pretty universal, believe me. And you ask yourself why? Why is it that people think in terms of pilots? Because today, Society is largely ascriptive, which means that status is given to you often based on title and not necessarily based on expertise. Look at who gets the reserved parking spot, who gets the corner office, who gets called to important meetings, who gets to fly business class. All of the small, small details, they all add up. They all are linked to titles. Now you can say, well, you know, it's fairly natural. After all, you work hard, you're smart, you're qualified, and somehow that re reflects your expertise. 
But the answer is that, is that really true? It's a good question to really ask. Is it really the case that the people with the right titles today in organizations are the people with the right expertise for the problems an organization faces? And the answer often is not necessarily so. And today what you're finding is because of the openness, because of the transparency, it is much easier for talent, for expertise to be visible. And it's an interesting question in terms of how does this talent get that recognition, get that status, get that social capital? Now, let's take a couple of examples. You probably have heard of this title, not title, the phenomenon called citizen journalism. It basically refers to citizens creating content which is news which people read and people accept as news. Now, I was recently giving a presentation to about 20 senior executives in the newspaper and the media sector. <coughs> and I used the example I thought was relevant for the sector, they would like it. As soon as I said the word citizen journalism, one person raised their hand and said, excuse me, you cannot use the term citizen journalism. You can say citizen observers, citizen witnesses, but not journalists. And that touched a very raw nerve with it. And we had a very good discussion in terms of why it was an emotional issue for him. Because for him, to be a journalist referred years of hard work in a journalism degree in a top university, years of hard work in a top media house, working the way up as a reporter to all the different levels. And now this person was a chief editor after having gone through all these different years of hard labor. And for him to call someone who hadn't done all that a journalist was shocking. How can you do that? Now the reality today is that at some level it doesn't really matter because people recognize the value and they respond to it. And the best example of that is Wikipedia. All of us I'm sure use Wikipedia at one point or the other and think about what Wikipedia did. You know the benchmark of expert knowledge really was the Encyclopedia Britannica. That was like the benchmark. I remember when I was in uh, high school, one year I did you know, very well in my studies, and my parents, as a gift, they bought the entire Britannica series for me. And I was so pleased, and we were all so happy, we put the volumes in the main living room. It was like a showcase, piece of display. And today it would not at all fit in out there. Why? Because you have this common, free knowledge base being created by individuals like you and me. Now, if you look at why do people do it, and this is the results from a research, a formal scientific paper, the number one reason is just pure fun. People like to share. Now you can ask the question, what about quality? This is one of the questions raised by journalists. Can you trust the quality of the citizens who contribute content? Can you trust the quality of people who contribute to Wikipedia? Very good question, because quality is important. Guess what? A scientific study comparing errors in Britannica and Wikipedia found no statistical difference in terms of the rate of errors between the two. In fact, guess what? Errors were made in Wikipedia, sometimes big errors, glaring errors, which got press attention, but they were caught faster and corrected faster by the community. So what happens is the community comes in 
and it's incredibly effective at how they catch errors and how they in fact correct errors in the community. So what you start seeing is how people, normal people, have come together and created collectively a source of knowledge which today has become some kind of a global reference and has destroyed completely the previous reference in this field. Why? Because expertise is now much more available, openly, democratic, and anyone can contribute his or her knowledge in a specific space. Now, in all this case, people ask about accountability, and this is very important. Now, what is also happening, and I must admit that we are in the initial stages of this, is there is much higher transparency in the entire system. Why? Because people want to give their opinions. So if you're an expert, if you're a professor, if you are a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a consultant, people want to tell the world about how good or how bad you are. This is a site, a real site, ratemyprofessor.com. In the US, and any student can go and fill up comments about a professor with whom the student has taken a class. This is a professor that has my same last name, and someone I know. And I can actually go and look at information about what students tell about him. Something that previously was considered quite private. The same thing is happening for all kinds of professionals. This is about medical doctors. Medical doctors are again another sacred profession. Very high level of expertise. Often, you have more information available online about the house you intend to buy than about the medical doctor you would end up using. And today what is happening is people are creating sites in which individuals are going and giving their views. Of course doctors, the experts, the professors, they don't like it. Now I gave the example of ratemyprofessor.com. In France, they tried to create a different same site, similar site in which students could rate the teachers. And guess what? The French education ministry stepped in and they got the legal system to close down the site. Because the argument was, these professors, or these teachers, are civil servants, employees of the state, and only the state has the right to evaluate them. Now, this is all archaic. This is going to, you know, eventually at some stage disappear. But you see how the state reacts. You see how the professors react. How, in a sense, there's a clash of values. Why? Because, as an expert, a medical doctor, a professor, whatever you do not necessarily want that kind of evaluation openly, in public. It is not something that you're used to. But guess what? This is what the world is moving towards. Now, this is being videotaped. This is most like some part will go on the YouTube. And people are going to comment upon it. And this is the world in which it's evolving. So in some sense, it's a very important issue in terms of how do organizations integrate all these new ideas. Now, let's take a very important issue facing organization, innovation. You know, traditional innovation was something that was largely done in the R&D labs of companies. And really, some of the best source of ideas come from your customers, your employees on a global basis, your business partners, from people around you. And a big challenge that you have is, how do you integrate these things inside your organization? This is a big question facing organizations. And believe me, the cultural barriers out here are severe. I'll give you a personal example from my own domain. If you think of universities, and I'm a member of one, what is the basic assumption? The basic assumption is, the professors, because of the titles, they create knowledge, and they are the guardians of knowledge. 
Now we all know that is not completely true. In fact, probably it's far from the truth. Today, especially for a business school and many of the domains, you have <coughs> alumni, 40,000 alumni, many dozens of thousands of alumni who create knowledge in their own environment. Now you ask business schools, why don't you integrate your knowledge into your teaching, into your research? And the answer would be quality, rigor, research, scientific, you know, all kinds of words used to defend and to argue why the research being produced or the ideas produced by executives working in the real world may not necessarily meet the standards that professors set for research. The same Wikipedia story. It is just that it is a much more closed environment, much more difficult to change. But the cultural resistance to this is extremely strong. And the same thing happens in all other organizations in different ways. So the key idea really today is because of the open, low barriers to access, higher transparency, you're able to see expertise much more easily. Especially in domains like videos and music and songs and other creative domains. And you can in fact get recognition of others much more easily, much more willingly, and perhaps in a more democratic fashion as opposed to before. The last one is on power. Now power is a very you know, exciting thing because a lot of people ultimately want to have power. And if you think traditionally, power has been very much topped out. So traditionally you have had the CEO's office, a few local nodes, the senior heads of geographies, a few nodes in the system which control the power. But today what is happening is power is getting more and more diffused. And this is creating interesting challenges. <coughs> and I was talking to the CIO of a large pharmaceutical company. Now if you think about the pharma business, they have been, become pretty good. And these are global pharmaceutical companies and identify who are the key influencers, who are the key doctors, who are the key medical associations. And they have got pretty good at working with them, trying to manage them, trying to influence them in terms of giving them research grants, giving them conference trips, other kinds of subsidies for the work. And they have built a whole system around that. Today what is happening is, in this world of medicine and pharmaceuticals, you're having all kinds of new powers emerging, new influences emerging. Ordinary people, parents, whose children are suffering from disease. And these companies are now struggling with trying to understand how do you identify who are the new power brokers? Who are the new influencers? And second is, how do you in fact work with them? For the doctors and the associations, we knew how to work with them. We knew, give a recent grant, conference trip, and so on. But how do you in fact buy out a mom whose child is very sick? Or a child may have suffered some tragic consequences. Now these are questions that the industry is struggling with. This diffusion of power is something which is a phenomenon happening around us and probably the best example of a leader who has exercised that power very effectively is Obama. Now we know very well Obama was a very unlikely candidate to become the president of the USA just two years ago. Now if you think about the political scene in the US, like many mature democracies, the political parties are 
fairly rigid classical organizations, wordingly structured with very well-defined power nodes. One can argue that the Democratic Party in the US was very much under the control of the Clintons. Now, think about Obama. He was, four or five years ago, an unknown senator. And what chances did he have of turning this Democratic Party machinery in his favor by working the traditional power structure? Probably very little. And in fact, that's one reason why he had to adopt a dramatically different strategy. It's something today people recognize as very innovative, but most people, even during the election, missed it almost completely. Now, if you look at statistics in terms of how we engage that population segment of voters below 30 in the USA, it is quite remarkable. You know, he basically was able to successfully energize this group. And today we know that 75% of the voters below 30 voted for Obama. Not just that, many of them in fact played very important roles in convincing their parents and their friends and all the friends of generations to vote for Obama. If you look at the passion that was created amongst the supporter base. One key metric is the number of videos produced by them. Obama's official campaign produced 2,000 videos. His supporters produced more than 400,000 videos. Look at the difference. 2,000 to more than 400,000, including the famous Yes We Can video that was very key in turning Obama into a household MTV star-like character in the USA. Now, he also used this diffuse power base to completely change the fundraising strategy. The traditional fundraising strategy and raising money is a very important part of winning election was Go to the rich people, identify the power nodes, go to the rich people and hold these fundraising dinners in which the rich people come and they make donations of whatever $10,000, 20000 each. And that is very important to keep in mind because Hillary was online, McCain was online, but those things didn't work. It is because the package, the leadership profile was more credible. Think about what kind of a leadership profile is required to succeed in this Web 2.0 world. I talked about openness. I talked about transparency. I talked about globality. Now what Obama did was, as you know very well, he wrote these two books. He basically laid open his whole life. Very complicated, very messy, details, but he shared them all with people. And of course, he had a very good charisma, he had a message, the timing, the number of factors that made for the package. But McCain and Hillary came across as highly controlled, not participative, not open. And that kind of a leadership profile is very important. Today you see it happening firsthand in the UK. It's a wonderful example of how a current sitting Prime Minister is going down in flames, driven partially and to a large degree by his inability to use these new media. I don't know how many of you have seen or been watching what has happened to Gordon Brown, but you know he has been destroyed by a number of videos that are floating around, most famously of him picking his nose in Parliament. So it basically means that you're always on stage, you know, so you can basically never be hidden. And even worse, based upon some advice, probably from not very good advices, he made a recent YouTube video on the MP expense. It's 
can, as you well aware, there's a whole hoopla happening in the UK around that. And his video was so terrible that it got slammed in the blogs left and right for his fake style, for his artificial, you know, whatever. Everything was bad in what he did. It's a good video to see, to learn what not to do. <laughs> and even worse, even worse, he disabled your comments. <laughs> Think about how stupid you can get. <laughs> so, you know, if you look about it, the whole idea of this generation is participation. You have to be open to get feedback, negative, whatever. And here's a man who fundamentally puts something out and disables viewers' comments. I mean, this is a classical example of a sitting leader who is getting killed in part because of what is happening, his inability to use this new medium. Now, I've always emphasized in my presentation that the implications of this are really global are really transcending all dimensions of society, both public and private. And I think it has very important implications also for society, governments, how we work, how we engage, how we interact with the government. And the same principles of transparency, openness, participation are going to influence the way we live and work in society. It will happen differently in different countries, but the principles are global, the principles are powerful, and the principles will keep pushing. Now here you see, for example, that you know, in many countries there are many concerns about water apathy. You know, waters are not concerned, they're not voting, especially the young are not very involved in politics. Now here is a great technology, a great tool, for creating that kind of involvement. It's a great way to give some space for the young to be able to express themselves. So you can in fact increase the level of participation, the level of transparency. And even if you don't have perfect democracies, I think the voice of the citizen can be heard much more explicitly. And this is very important because this can change eventually the world around us and can lead to lower corruption, can lead to better governance, can lead to better societies ultimately for all of us. So what, you know, in summary, I think what is happening around us? I started by saying that the key message really is it is not a question of technology. Of course technology is enabling, pushing, accelerating the change. But it is a question of shifting values, shifting principles. And fundamentally, at some level, we are being challenged in some of our core assumptions about how we organize ourselves, how we manage, how we interact, how we exercise influence. Now, if you look at history, the shift of power, even if it's partial, never happens always smoothly. There's always resistance, there's always some kind of pushback, and the challenge for us is to be able to manage this process smoothly. And doing this will not be easy always, because some people will have to change their behaviors, some people may have to give up some established rights which they have earned, but fundamentally, the direction, the direction of change out here is pretty clear. In my view, it's pretty unstoppable. Now, my last slide is this. So what is the bottom line? The bottom line is this whole social media space is extremely powerful. Don't underestimate. It's not a question of Facebook or Flickr or posting videos here and there. It's a question of new values being adopted by a whole generation around the world. And this global nature of the connected system around us is going to create change. You know, when I was at Davos also, I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of, you know, especially in January, go back about five months, people were in doom and gloom about the economy. 
So that was all the sessions about economy where disaster, disaster, disaster. That's that of the word. And then I was also involved in sessions around technology. And there you had optimism. There you had hope. And a lot of the young people in the technology sessions came with something on value. And you could see them. You know, in January they were excited because they felt they had changed the world. Changed the world through helping elect Obama. It remains to be seen Obama does, and I'm not claiming he'd be the best president or correct everything, but there was the sense that they had changed the course of American history and maybe the course of the world. So there was a sense of achievement, and this is very powerful because the future is bright. The future is exciting. The amount of technology adoption, the change of values, all these are very exciting things. Especially in a part of the world, like this part of the world, where you have a lot of young people. Young people are growing up with this excitement, with this set of values and this set of hopes. And even at a corporate level, I think what it means is we can use these technologies for doing some of our core elements more effectively. We can certainly improve the way we think about branding. Branding is no longer something that you manage. Branding is in fact something you co-manage. You co-own your brand with your customers. The most or second most successful page on Facebook is the Coca-Cola page. Created not Coca-Cola, but by fans Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is in fact working with the fans to help manage their brand. Branding is co-owned. You get in fact brand better by involving your customers. You can engage much more widely. IBM decided to revisit the values of the company and what they did was they engaged the entire population of the company. More than 80,000 people contributed their views on what should the values of IBM be. Another 100,000 read, did not contribute, at least participated in terms of reading what is happening. Now what you see is you can get much more of a buy-in, much more of a wider engagement across your company, across your business ecosystem using these technologies. The power is there to engage widely if you want to do so. You can increase the rate of learning. Today many companies are in Twitter. Twitter to obtain rapid feedback about products, about new product launches, about customer service failures. So you have a number of different aspects by which you can increase your rate of learning. And of course, these technologies give you the possibility to learn faster. Ultimately, in a world that is fast changing, if you can speed up your rate of learning, that can be very powerful for the organization. And of course, leadership. You can lead more effectively if you're able to use these technologies more creatively. And of course, for that, as I've emphasized before, you need to be able to adapt, perhaps, a different leadership style. A leadership style that is a little bit more humble. A leadership style a little bit more open. A leadership style that is more inclusive. A leader who does not claim to have all the answers. A leader who does not claim to know it all a leader who does not claim to be right always, but someone who's able to involve, be humble, be more credible, and be more human at the end of the day. I think these all are very important phenomena, very important changes happening around us. It will require us to change our behaviors, to trust people more, and to engage in dialogues more. And ultimately, ultimately, it requires us to give up some control. Now this is a very delicate issue because classical organizations, classical power structures have been built on the basis of maintaining control. Everyone wants to maintain control in the traditional space. As a professor, I want to maintain control over what happened in class. I want to control what is taught. Now, you have to be able to loosen that control. 
of course, without losing control. Because if you don't give up some control, eventually the people will take the control. And that can be very dangerous. So I think what is important out here is to have this balance and to be able to manage that tension. And we all do it when we have children who grow up. When we have children who grow up, you know it that as they become teenagers and young adults, you have to give them the space, the freedom. Because if you kept controlling them in the same way as you did when they are much younger, they would probably grow up as very ineffective young adults. So you have to be able to give the space to them to grow up also as young adults. And this tension is something which we have to be able to manage effectively. So thank you very much for your patience. I tried to share with you some of my thoughts, some of my ideas. There's a lot of work that we're doing in this space and clearly I think these kinds of ideas are going to have tremendous implications for all parts of the world, especially this part of the world. And there's a lot of interesting new research that can be done about how these new ideas, new technologies are being adopted, are being influenced by the young people in this part of the world. I hope you find the time to read the book eventually, some of you. And certainly if you have any feedback, I'll be happy to get feedback from you. And thank you very much once again for your Today marks the World Telecommunication and Information Society Day. This year's theme is protecting uh, children inside of space. How is the emergence of uh, social networking uh, sites impacting the safety of our children online? And uh, what should we be doing to protect them? Can you hear me if I speak? Okay, uh, you know, I, I already mentioned the challenges around uh, privacy and security earlier. And this is a very important issue, so I don't want to underplay the importance of the issue. There's a natural tendency of many of our younger kids and younger adults, colleagues, to be much more open. I emphasize the desire to be open and to be more willing to share. And there is sometimes not a complete realization of the longer term implications of that. So what we need to do is, as the world is not perfect, as, as the world is not perfect, and as the world will take some time to evolve and change, we need to reinforce education. Education in schools and universities about how to use these technologies effectively and at the same time without hurting some of your own private interests. And the challenge out here is that education in these domains is seriously challenged because most teachers have got no clue what's happening and uh, they're often very shy to even go in those areas. And uh, I always commend teachers who are willing to learn from the young students. In Finland, for example, is a program in which about 3,000 teachers are being mentored by their students on some of these technologies. So think about this, students teaching teachers. I think that's a great way to be able to educate the teachers about some of these dangers. So once the teachers are better prepared, and are currently better prepared, I think our younger generation would be more prepared also for these kind of risks. Thank you. So I just want to make note, you know, if you, if you want to ask a question in Arabic, we do have the translation and uh, Dr. Sumatra yeah, and, uh, can uh, answer your question in both languages. So I can't answer in Arabic, so that's <laughs> Yeah, but you can hear I think the question is... <laughs> so, uh, any question from the audience? Yes, please. You can say your name and question. Hello, uh, my name is Suzanne from patternhappening.com. And uh, my question is uh, probably more directed to ICT, but it was inspired by something that you said. Uh, in, our, in our website, we're endeavoring eventually to become very open and 
interactive. And then uh, we have to take into consideration the environment that we work under here. So my question for ICT is with respect to censorship and how that, you see that impacting and how that may loosen up because, uh, you know, I had conditions where I was told I cannot advertise counterhappy.com, I cannot get a license, we're not sure what to do with it. So what is the future for that? Because we see the future for our web-based uh, business really being subjected to openness. Is there somebody here who can help us with that? Well, I'm not sure I can help you with that, but uh, what I can tell you is that, uh, you know, technology as always has to be embedded in the local context. Uh, technology fundamentally is organization neutral, and you have to embed in the right context. So, I'm not fully aware of the details of the context that you're facing in your business, but my general message would be is, whichever business is trying to launch, you have to embed it in the context in which you operate. Now, if your context is the local context out here, you have to be aware of that. If your context and the customers are more global, you also have to be aware of that. So you have to have a balance between these different contextual conditions. Yes, I'd like to clarify one of the that. Uh, <laughs> comment from. I'd just like to clarify one, one point. I should say, Allah, we do not uh, censor the content. So, 100% if you have anything you can publish it and we have no uh, power to say yes or no. Any question? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for uh, this uh, enlightenment, for someone who's not the web free anyway. Uh, my question is, when we see to the world right now, we see like you know, certain things that emerge, of course, especially technology and kind of phenomena. While there are certain things like, for example, international law, international development, and probably international corporate responsibility, which is not really, you know, on the same pace to speak with these kind of changes to redefine relationships between cultures and between people and so on and so forth. So with that kind of imbalance in the other kind of probably uh, 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 corporate governments or global governments. Uh, of course, people attitude would be, some of the rejections, for example, or isolation, in isolation, for example, because of these religious values. Some would be probably more open, uh, uh, and, and somehow there is a balance in the middle, uh, which probably could end up in duplicity, maybe show off, and uh, probably would present Bernard uh, Madoff prior to his, you know, uh, all this uh, corporate financial crisis way, way ahead, and maybe the world will be safer. What's your input on this, please? Well, I think you raised a couple of interesting, important issues out there. So let me let me try to give a sense of what I took from your question. Uh, on the first issue of global governance, there is a very key and fundamental problem that we are facing today in the world. A lot of the issues that we face today are global issues, be it climate, be it terrorism, be it uh, environment, be it many other issues like that. And our current structures, which were largely put in place after the Second World War, are grossly inadequate for that. So there is a mismatch today between the international structures that we have and the global problems we're facing. And as you can see, even the simple issue like changing the voting structure in uh, you know, the world financial institutions, it becomes a major issue in terms of who gives up some power to let who else new players that in the scenario. So I think the transformation of a lot of the existing structures, the creation of new structures, is an area where we are lagging behind. I hope that the social networks and these kinds of global create some kind of governance mechanisms for these things in the future, but right now none exist. So I hope that you know, there is some kind of a new medium emerging which transcends boundaries and eventually they can help to at least be part of the solution. Uh, I'll give you a very simple example of how we are very initial days, but um, at the World Economic Forum this time, in some of the sessions, they had a partnership with Facebook in which they discuss some issues, issues being discussed, and for some issues they said, okay, let's get opinion of people around the world. And they posed the question, 
to 150,000 Facebook people using it with sign up. And you got responses from 150,000 people in real time. And that was amazingly powerful. Now think about tomorrow Facebook has a population the size of the US, 300 million or even more perhaps, and it transcends boundaries. And if you're able to involve people in decision making or at least getting feedback on key values or key issues, that can perhaps create some new methods of governance or at least some participation in the governance mechanism. So let's hope so that this actually leads to something interesting. The second issue you mentioned in terms of transparency, in terms of how to avoid uh, situations like Madoff or other kinds of uh, disasters like that. Um, yes, I agree that if you had more transparency and more openness, some of these unfortunate accidents in the national world could perhaps have been avoided. But I'm not completely sure that you know, human greed is a very basic emotion. And human greed often overcomes all rational behavior. So I'm not completely sure that we would overcome that basic human emotion of greed and, you know, uh, that easily. So let's hope so it will become easier to detect some of these frauds or some of these disasters situations in the future. But I'm optimistic, but not completely sure. Uh, I think, uh, Thank you, Dr. Sumanto, for your great lecture. I just have a question about spamming. Because now uh, we have millions of users, a lot of corporations look for these millions of users, and so they just want access to this database, basically. All around the world, you have many social networks, whether Facebook, or MySpace. And so you think at some stage these corporates might use these profiles for marketing purposes, for media purposes, for brainwashing at some stage, uh, that's my question, actually. Well, it's a, it's a very important question, and certainly as people spend more and more of the time online, uh, there will be organizations, including the providers of the network themselves, in this case, companies like Facebook or others, who are going to try to utilize information for at least monetize it. So, as individual customers or consumers, we might have the risk of being spammed by too many emails or having junk emails fill our life or at least junk messages. But the important issue is, you know, if you think about mail, what is the difference between very relevant mail for you and junk mail? And the issue is when it satisfies a need that you have, then that is a very relevant issue for you. So if you're able to identify the context for precisely and send you a response which is very specific to your context and become more intelligent about doing so, maybe it will not be junk for you or junk for someone else, but not junk for you. If I can do it only for you, not for 100 other people, maybe it's a good use. Now, we are not yet there at the level of intelligent technology, but there's a lot of progress happening in the dimension also. So I'm hopeful on that. I think we have a question in the back. Thank you, Dr. Um, you said that um, employers should not have a rigid approach uh, towards employees um, using Facebook or other social networking sites. Uh, but don't you think that an employee should understand that uh, uh, an employee should not post bad information or gossip about a company? or a business, because this would affect the reputation of a business online. Uh, so don't you think the employee should understand, should understand that? You know, come back to the question of trust I had in my last slide. So at some level, you have to trust your people. And you have to assume that people are good and they want to do the right things. Uh, if an employee wants to talk badly about you, they don't need faith to do so. They can do it without Facebook or even outside the work environment, they can do it. The challenge is to be able to let people develop the right kind of community standards to be able to express themselves constructively. And I would post you that most employees want to be constructive, they want to be heard. And if the management is such that management is hearing, listening and participating in solving problems, my own sense is people will respect that and people will in fact respond positively. 
I'll give you a real example from IBM. In IBM, they actually encourage employees to blow. But what they decided was, they decided to allow the employees themselves to come up with some guidelines for blogging. They said, okay, you know, what are some guidelines for blogging? And let's form them in the community. And today, they have a public document. If you go on IBM's site, there's a short, about five-page document, which is a set of guidelines formed by the community themselves about what, how to blog, when to blog, what to blog. And the community is extremely strong in enforcing it. When someone violates the guidelines, the community comes in themselves and peer to peer the correct and they in fact enforce guidelines. So what is important out here is the sense of participation and the sense of being able to express your views and to be able to have them listen to. Yes, uh, I just have one question, and that's concerning the, uh, the misuse of some services or social networks. I mean, Facebook, uh, you know, it's an open thing, and anybody can use it. Um, when it gets misused, do you think it's, uh, it is uh, justified to close down the service by some authority? Because only a few weeks ago, I got uh, an email about Facebook saying that the Israelis are using it, therefore we should sort of boycott it. I mean, we know that Israelis use every tool that's available, it's not only Facebook. But are you against or with closing services when people misuse it? It comes back to the questions of governance that were raised earlier. Uh, because fundamentally, people, you know, we, we, we don't have effective means of governance in these new emergent structures. Today, traditionally, think about how you enforce rule society. So you have nation states, boundaries, nations have rules, and when people violate rules, you have the police, you have other kinds of legal ways to enforce and to sort of penalize people if required. Today, in a much more horizontal, much more fluid, much more dynamic and global environments like Facebook, we don't have those effective governance mechanisms set up in place. So you could, you could, for example, try to enforce some control in one part of it, based on your own local national context. But those would probably not be fails proof, or probably people if they really wanted to, they could find a way around it. Are you justified in doing so? I would answer that's a decision based on your own local context and rules. I don't think so. I have the you know right to question what some people do and some people don't, because you have to be able to apply to local context. I always maintain technology has to be applied local context. Now, ultimately, you have to make on that decision. Okay, I think we'll take the last question. So, please. Thank you, this was a very intellectual presentation. I am the above 30 group, and I think I have reasonable computer skills, but I'm not a very fan of uh, Facebook. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, I must disagree with you that uh, companies are banning or organizations are banning Facebook because of uh, uh, they are afraid of it or it's a cultural uh, clash. I think they have their other good reasons for it. Uh, and it can, you can have a democratic culture and listen to employees without really having Facebook access. The question I have is uh, what am I missing as an individual or as an organization or will be missing? in the future, uh, if I'm not supportive of these kind of uh, social networks. Thank you. So, you know, my, my comment on that would be, I think it's an excellent last question, because my comment on that would be, don't think of this as Facebook or Twitter or some other social network. I, I think if you left thinking that this is about how to join Facebook and when to shut down Facebook and when to do a technology, I think that would be the wrong message. The, wrong, the right message out here really is about a set of values becoming a society around us. Because of the shared information infrastructure that we all are sharing, a certain generation of people are growing up out here. Globality, openness, transparency, interactivity, and these kinds of values and expectations are the important things. So my message always is think about how to adopt these values inside your business and how to integrate them. You can do them in a face-to-face -face manner, 
can do that without Facebook, can do it without technology. But in many cases today, given the global nature of the world, technology often becomes a key enabler. But think in terms of values and principles, less in terms of specific technologies. But tomorrow they might something else, which might be a specific technology. I said the last question, but I think uh, Dr. Bader wants to ask the question. I, I think I, I really enjoyed your uh, actual presentation. Thank you. Uh, if I think 10 years from now, I think what's happening now, probably a lot of people think that this is a transformation in the global society. Uh, we know that technology is doing that, but the tool uh, is doing that even more. Uh, and I think this is uh, a time where many terms uh, have been uh, being defined or redefined. Privacy, what is privacy is something that is being redefined. Power is being redefined. I also hear you say that uh, a lot of, I mean, learning is being redefined. If I, I think 10 years from now, I think kids will be really empowered through this technology. I think kids are already, as you stated, uh, lead, leading uh, the learning in Finland and other countries and will do uh, more uh, so uh, in, in a few years. Um, but also I see that through the technology and the social networking, um, work will be redefined. I think maybe uh, the younger generation will probably lead because of their creativity and because of, uh, of the way they uh, were, had access to more information and more technology. What will the, the, the role of older people be? The, uh, over 30. The good, the good news is the young people grow old also, you know, so they don't stay young at all, so, so uh, at least age-wise, mentally they probably stay young. Let, let me just make two or three of quick comments. The first one is on learning. Your first comment is very important because I believe that education is one of the most low-changing sectors. And to change the way people teach is a very painful process. I'm part of that pain, I'm part of the distance, but in some sense, I was at a conference recently and talking about how people learn and how perhaps it's changed. You know, when I went through school, uh, I went through school in India, my daughter went through school in France. At least in these two countries, I saw it firsthand. The importance, that, you know, education in school is based on one important premise, is the importance of long-term memory. So you can memorize capitals, memorize multiplication tables, memorize all kinds of details. And in today's world, where you can access information so easily, we can ask the question, what is the importance of this long-term memory? Where short-term memory is really what is available for free. So fundamentally, what you need is perhaps a different way, a different sort of skill set that you teach people, and this involves radical rethinking of the entire education curriculum. Now, on the issue of, uh, let's say, age, it is a reality that, you know, there are people who know more than some other things uh, about technology than some others. And my recommendation to most people would be don't be shy. Be open to learning. And in fact, the best thing is learn from someone younger than you. And guess what? The younger person also has things to learn. The younger person doesn't know at all. And when you have these kinds of uh, you know, reverse mentorship schemes, clearly the older colleague can learn from the younger one. But the younger one also has a lot to learn about business, about strategy, about life, about people, relationships, and the older one. So I think there is a give and take in the process. Thank you, Mr. Matra. For all of this.